Well, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Metal Company's channel, developing the world's largest estimated resource of metals required for the electric vehicle and low-carbon energy future. Joining us to discuss uh, some recent news, uh, obviously the industry as it expands uh, into the sea here, we've got Craig, the CFO, joining us always. Welcome back, sir. Thank you, Kyle. Pleasure to be here again. It was a pleasure to get back on. So I want to dive into this with, first and foremost, the metal company uh, and SGS produced the world's first nickel sulfate from deep sea floor polymetallic nodules, which is uh, what I know you guys have been uh, kind of obviously exploring. Do you want to just talk about what this means for the company? Yeah, absolutely. Look, it's something that we've been working on for a long time, and I think it shows that end to end, you can take these nodules, pick them up off the sea floor, bring them to shore processing, and that we've now at a bench scale been able to show in a pilot scale be able to show that we can convert it into the key precursors for batteries. So what we're producing is the world's largest estimated undeveloped source of battery metals, the world's largest nickel project. And now this shows anybody, look, we can take this and bring it all the way to nickel sulfate. Um, and you know that sulfate ending up in batteries is uh, something that's going to really spur along the clean energy transition. It doesn't mean that we're necessarily going to sell nickel sulfate. In fact, because we're taking a capital approach to development, we're using existing drill ships to collect these nodules off the seafloor. We're using existing RKEF lines, processing facilities, initially in Japan, for example, to turn this nodule into an intermediate product that can then be further refined by our customers. So this doesn't mean we're going to go out and spend billions of dollars and build new facilities. We're going to take advantage of existing facilities and existing infrastructure such as that which exists in Japan. But it shows that this can be done. It shows that you can take these nodules and the key metals in it and bring it all the way to the precursors for the batteries necessary to wean ourselves off of fossil fuels. And can you kind of just discuss, um, you know, the political forefront of this conversation about kind of, you know, mining out of the ocean? Um, you know, what's kind of the the front of the news on this and where do you guys kind of see yourself sitting as it stands today? Sure. Look, we, we never like to use the word mining, but, you know, what we're doing is effectively collecting a resource off of the seafloor, loosely attached rocks, picking them up really like golf balls on a driving range. But there are others that are moving forward with what could be better described as mining. In fact, Norway announced earlier this year that they're opening up their territorial waters for deep sea exploration and then pending environmental work, potentially exploitation. Unlikely, of course, to occur until the 2030s at the earliest. Japan has announced that they're looking to seafloor mud to get rare earths. China has made major announcements in terms of the five contracts they have for the collection of seafloor resources in international waters. And that action by China has actually drawn out a uh, response from the United States and bills of Congress, letters from former military and political leaders like Hillary Clinton, demanding that the U.S. join the regulator to get access to this resource, resources in which TMC already controls some of the best ground in a very good neighborhood and has done more work than anybody else. So that all bodes well for TMC and our strategic positioning as these geopolitical tailwinds are blowing. But uh, keep in mind effectively, you know, the top four countries in the world by population, China, India, United States, Indonesia, they've all in one form or another made positive statements for the deep sea mining over the last uh, several months. So we're very positive on where this is going. And you've also been attracting um, some other investors. I mean, renowned Silicon Valley investor, Steve uh, Jurvetson. Do you want to talk about uh, what he means for the company and uh, just kind of this uh, interesting, you know, uh, bringing in of these new investors? Yeah, absolutely. So Steve Jurvetson, uh, happy to join uh, TMC's board. We're very happy to have him. He uh, had many years on the Tesla board of directors. He's currently a SpaceX director. And he's a renowned uh, Silicon Valley investor with a great track record. And getting him on board, and frankly, not just in terms of his advisory capability, which is gonna be very valuable to us, but also many of the doors that he could potentially open within Silicon Valley and elsewhere. Um, it's very helpful to get increasingly loud voices and increasingly public voices who are willing to say, you know what, these nodules actually represent the best potential source for getting the metals we need for the clean transition. I mean, take a step back in terms of where else we might go to get nickel or cobalt. The main area to get cobalt is in the Democratic Republic of Congo. There is a report out just last month noting that roughly one third of the great ape population, chimpanzees, gorillas, et cetera, might be at risk. One third might be at risk due to nickel and cobalt mining. I mean, that's a staggering amount. Um, Mighty Earth, the NGO, was focused on Indonesia, noting that in order to get the metals necessary for electric vehicles, a lot of brands are looking to Indonesian rainforests. And of course, we would rather pick up rocks off the seafloor 
than destroy our biodiverse carbon storing rainforests, they estimate that half a million hectares of land could be at risk due to nickel mining. TMC represents a major antidote to that. So there are a lot of people who are focused on that. Steve Jurvetson's focused on it. And the narrative, I think, is starting to change. Importantly, though, the narrative is something that's going to take a long time to work its way into public consciousness. And we want the narrative to move in the right direction. But what really matters for us is finishing our work, finishing our environmental impact statement, finishing our application to the regulator that will allow us to begin commercial production in early 2026. That's where all of our resources and team uh, are focused at the moment. On that note, we'll pass it off to the viewers as always. We'd love to know what you think and consider subscribing for Catalyst and news like this as it hits the wire. We're going to bring it to you here. But on that, we look forward to catching you in the next one.